Good. Now I'd like you to turn with me to Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 to 29. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 to 29. Now in the previous passage, which was just a few weeks ago, we talked about this question of uh, the person of the Lord Jesus. Do you remember that? It's the person of the Lord Jesus which is the antidote to uh, Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a Christian heresy. They didn't think they were heretics. They just had got something wrong in their head about the Lord Jesus. I was talking to a guy just this week, and he was telling me, he said, of course, the Lord Jesus is not from eternity to eternity. And I went, pardon? He said again. He said, no, 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 the Lord Jesus had a beginning. I said, right, what do you mean by that? And he said, oh, well, the Lord Jesus, you see, before creation was ever made, he was made. I said, no, I think that's wrong. Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the one who has neither beginning nor end. So Jesus Christ is not ever created, okay? Never was created. He is God manifest in flesh. Of course, we know that God himself never had a beginning. The Father never had a beginning, and the Holy Spirit never had a beginning, and the Son never had a beginning. They are from eternity. And Gnosticism was this particular idea, In we see it in this passage, in which they tried to rationalise, and they thought maybe Jesus was once an angel that became a man. Well, that's the Jehovah's Witnesses for you. Maybe he was a man that became an angel. Well, that's the Mormons for you. See, they're all, they're all just in this era, aren't they? Uh, well, maybe he was just somebody that was first created. No, no, that's Gnosticism. And that's Jehovah's Witnesses. They all believe in that. This is not the truth. This is error. Serious error. In fact, it's the sort of error that's so serious that it's called heresy. And the word heresy means division. There is a division amongst believers because of false teaching. And what Paul has done from verse 20 onwards, he says, having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you who were at some time alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight, if you continue in the faith grounded and settled. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you heard and which was preached to every creature, which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. So what the, Apostle, what the Apostle Paul does is he explains to us, hello, come in, he explains to us the wonderful work that Christ has accomplished on the cross, okay, and that work has been accomplished through the body of the Lord Jesus dying. His, hello there, just make yourself comfortable, okay? He died upon the cross, and through his body dying on the cross, he has, um, he has obtained this glorious um, reconciliation. Do you know, I think of all the words I love, the word reconciliation is beautiful. Reconciliation is what happens when two people are strangers, or when two people have fell out. They cannot talk to one another anymore. And that's a little bit like us in mankind and God. Us, have, we've gone our own way. We've turned everyone to his own path. and But now in the Lord Jesus, he has reconciled those that are sinners back to himself. And now when you're a Christian, you are united to the Lord Jesus. Now from verse 24 onward, Paul then brings up one sentence I'm going to preach today on one sentence, okay? Except that it covers one, two, three, four, five, six verses. Do you know, I told you, didn't I, that you've got to watch Paul. You've got to watch, of course, when Paul was writing, there were no full stops. 
You know that, don't you? And there were no commas. There's no, there's no punctuation in Greek. But this particular sentence is one complete thought. It's a series of phrases knit together into one sentence. And, and it's all about Paul and his ministry. Okay? It's all about his ministry. He said in the previous verse, verse 23, he says, he says, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. And then he breaks off. You could put this, you could put the next few verse, this, this sentence in brackets. Because he says, while I'm talking about me, a minister, I'll just tell you a little bit about that. It could be a parenthesis. He says, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. Now, let's just watch that a minute now. I said again, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. Now, just a minute now. Is Paul saying, I am suffering for you? Yes, that's what he's saying. Let's look at this a little bit more closely. I'm going to go through this sentence bit by bit and phrase by phrase. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Now let me just explain. Paul rejoices in the sufferings that he has on behalf of and he wants them to fill up what is lacking of the sufferings of Christ in his flesh for the sake of the church, which is his body. Now let me just stop a minute and explain this. I want you to imagine that God has a vessel that big. And it's a vessel of suffering. Okay? And at the moment, it's not very much topped up. And what Paul says is this. He says, there is a certain amount of flack, a certain amount of persecution. There's a certain amount of trouble that you receive for being a Christian. I'd like to take it all on board for you. Wow. He says, I want to draw as much of the flack from the enemy as I can so that you might have none. Do you remember the story of the dam busters when they went to blow up the, the, the Moor Dam and all these dams? In, in They sent out quite a number of aeroplanes. I think it was about 12. I'm not sure exactly, about 12. Some of those aeroplanes didn't have any bombs. So it's a strange thing, isn't it? You see, they weren't there to bomb the dam. They were there to sacrifice themselves on behalf of those who were dropping the bombs. And when everybody was shooting at them, they weren't shooting at the people with the bomb. And so what their job was to draw the flak, to draw all the enemy fire, to protect their comrades who were doing the attack on the dams. And Paul says this, he says, you Colossians, he says, there's so much suffering for Christ, a sort of a measure of suffering for Christ. And what I do is I conduct myself in a way that I get all the bullets and you get off scot-free. Now, this is courage and devotion of the highest order. In the British Army, if a person has courage like that and takes all the flak on behalf of the enemy, he is awarded a Victoria Cross. And that Victoria Cross is re re awarded for the highest valour. Because what he's doing is he's putting himself in front of the enemy on behalf of his colleagues. And Paul says, that's what I'm doing for you. I'm taking all the flack and I'm taking all the punishment and taking all the persecution so that you might have none. Now that's what you call love. That's love. He draws the fire of the enemy so that they might escape. And he sacrifices himself in the process. You say, how does he manage to survive? Well, he has the supernatural power of God to deliver him. But Paul doesn't see this as a hardship. He sees this as a privilege and a joy. Now, let me ask you something. You say, is this very unusual? No, it's not unusual. How many of you that are mothers would give your life to save the life of your child? Oh, you would, wouldn't you? How many of you that are fathers would willingly die if only your son could live? You would, wouldn't you? 
And what Paul says is this. He says, I love you to such a degree that I'm prepared to take all your persecution for you so that you don't have to have it. Now this is the first qualification for being a minister. The first qualification is this, a willingness to put one's life on the line for one's brethren. In fact, on another passage it says, we ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. Remember what the Lord Jesus says. He says, I am the good shepherd. How do you know what a good shepherd is? He says, I am the good shepherd because I give my life for the sheep. That is what you call a good shepherd. So he says in verse 25, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Now, let me look at this word. There's lots of, I'm, I'm what's called a dispensationalist. Do you want to say that with me? Dispensationalist. It's because I believe in what's called in the Bible dispensations. Now, a dispensation is a special period of time in which God deals with mankind in a specific way. I'll give you an example. I remember when I was quite a young boy, uh, my mother used to say to me, go, there's the book, little little red book, you go to the shop and pick up the shopping. And I used to say, well, where, what about the money? Oh, don't worry, he's given me a special dispensation. What does that mean? It means that he's doing something completely different to what he normally does. Normally when you go into a shop, you have to pay for it, don't you? So you have to pay for it. You do, you do have to pay for your stuff, don't you, when you go into a shop? But not on this day. No, there was a special arrangement, you see, in which it was written down in a book. And at the end of the month, my mother used to go along to the shop and pay the money down for all of it. She was having a special dispensation. She was having a period of time in which the normal rules were suspended and something else happened. And that's what dispensation is. And Paul explains it in verse 26. He's, let me, but let me go back a little bit first. I don't want to confuse you. He says, I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. He refers to himself as a minister of God, spe specifically in relation to this stewardship. The word is stewardship, in which he has received a special ministry from God, and he's going to explain what it is. He says, my special ministry from God is to deliver the message of God concerning the church of God. Now, let me explain this a little bit more. Now, the word mystery, okay, the word mystery, it doesn't mean something ooh, mysterious. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean, ooh, somebody's committed a crime and Poirot is going to go and solve it. No, it's nothing to do with Poirot, no. It's not about something secret like that. It's not about a detective novel. The word mystery is something that's very simple to understand. It means something that previous generations never knew about, which has now been revealed. That's called a mystery. You've got that, haven't you? That's a mystery. And Paul says this. He says this mystery of the church of God was something that was hidden in God in previous ages and generations, but is now revealed to the church. Okay? And what is this mystery? The mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery. So then, the presence of Christ in the New Testament believer Okay, In my heart, in your heart, the presence of Christ in our lives is the basis of the hope that the believer will one day be resurrected and glorified and go to heaven to be with him forever. That is a mystery that nobody knew. If you're reading through the Gospels, you won't find this mystery there. Do you know why? Because when the Gospels were being lived out, nobody knew about it. If you go to Matthew, you won't find anything about the church. Oh, you'll find the word used, but it's used in a different context for different people. You won't find anything about the church in John's Gospel, or Mark, or Luke. And you won't find anything in Malachi, or in the Psalms, or any of the, or the Genesis. 
You just won't find it. Why not? Because at that particular time, when those books were being written, and when those books were being lived, nobody knew about it. Well, who did know about it? Well, God knew about it, but nobody else. And until Paul came along, and reveal, until God revealed to Paul about the mystery of the church, nobody knew about it. Nobody. And that's why Paul says, this is the mystery which has been hidden in God, but which is now revealed unto the saints. Now verse 28. Whom we preach, warning every man, and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. So what Paul says is this. He says, because of this great mystery that God has given to me, I preach. This is what I preach. And what do I preach? I preach warnings to every believer. And that's what I would preach to you in this church too. I give you warnings. Say, warnings of what? Warning of hellfire? No. I don't preach that to Christians at all. Why don't I preach that to Christians? Because they're not going to hell. What do I preach to Christians? I preach warnings that I might present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. What I'm saying is this, is that if Christ comes right now, he's going to say to me, Stephen, were you a faithful preacher? Did you teach these people how to live a holy life? Did you teach these people how to live a life in the community that was an honour to Christ? And hopefully the answer is yes. Of course, it's not my responsibility to live your life. But it is my responsibility to tell you that you should live honestly, that you should live soberly in this present world. Why? Why? Because Christ is coming. I wouldn't want to be the pastor that stands there at the rapture and says, I'm ever so sorry, Lord, but they were all rubbish because I never told them to live a good life. And they never did live a good life. And they were drunkards and they were wife beaters and they stole and they lied. I would not like to be like that. And so my message to you is to warn you, you have to have a life that's holy, not in order for you to become saved, but because you're saved. That's how you live. Why is it that you don't steal? Because you're saved. Why is it you don't beat your wife? Because you're saved. Why is it that you're honest? Because you're saved. You're not, you're not being honest in order to be saved. No, you're saying, now I'm saved. I can't do those things. They're part of the old life. They're not part of this present life. He says, I want to present every believer complete in Christ Jesus. Isn't that a lovely thought? That when Christ comes to meet us, we can be complete in him. We can be, first of all, saved. We can, secondly, be faithful. We can be honourable. We can be holy. We can be upright in our lives. We can be faithful. What a great thing that you've got to live up to. But, you know, nobody ever gets saved by doing these things. Nobody gets saved by living a good life. You cannot save yourself. Only the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ saves. However, if you have been saved, well then you have a duty to live a life that is honouring and glorifying to the Lord Jesus. Verse 29. Whereunto I also labour, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. They're great words, aren't they? Let me tell you what it means. Paul says, it's for this purpose that I work myself to exhaustion. That's what labour means. I work myself to exhaustion, striving according to the almighty power of God, which is inside me working away. Let me ask you something. Can you make yourself holy? No. Can you make yourself honest? Not really, no. Can you make yourself faithful? No. But God, the Holy Spirit, can work a way in your life. He can make you holy. And he can make you faithful. And he can make you honest. 
And so your job is not to make yourself better. Your job is to allow God, the Holy Spirit, inside your life to change you from inside out. So if you, if you claim to be a Christian, maybe at your school, people say, oh yeah, so-and-so, yeah, it's a Christian, goes to church. So let me ask you something. If that's the case, if that's what they call you, now is God at work in your life changing you inside? Is the Holy Spirit moving in your heart to make you honest, to make you upright, to make you reliable? To make you a good example. That's the Christian walk. He says the almighty power of God is working inside me mightily. Paul's work was exhausting. But it wasn't in his own strength. It was in the enabling power of the Holy Spirit in his weak body. In his very weak body. Do you know what? The Apostle Paul was a person who had lots and lots of problems physically. People talk about him having a problem with his sight. It's very possible. People, people talk about him being little in stature. They talk about him being weak in body. Not strong at all. Okay? But Paul says, he says, when I am weak, then I am strong. How is that possible? How can you be weak? How can you be strong when you're weak? You can be strong because of the power of God within, coming out in your life. That's how you can become mighty. He says this work is exhausting, but it's not exhausting in my strength. It is exhausting in the enabling power of the Holy Spirit. Let me just say something to you. Just stop for a minute and think about this. I'll stop talking so you just gather your thoughts. You ready? Got this now? Write this down if you've got a pen. You can't live the Christian life. I've got that now. You can't live the Christian life. Have you tried? It's not easy, is it? You can't do it. The quicker you give up, the better. God, the Holy Spirit, comes within a Christian and he lives the life. And the measure in which we're successful as Christians is merely the measure in which we surrender to him and allow him to work in our lives. All we need to do is to learn to let the Holy Spirit take charge and work in our lives. That's the secret. Okay? I remember a young man coming to me many, many years ago and he said to me, Stephen, I'm terribly dejected. He said, I've really tried to live the Christian life. I keep failing in front of all my classmates. I say things wrong. I swear I do things wrong. And I said, well, I'm glad that you've said that you're trying to live the Christian life. And I'm glad that you're failing. He said, what do you mean? I said, I'm glad that you're failing because I said, that's the first lesson you've got to learn as a Christian is that you can't do it. And when you get to the point in which you're just about to give up, you'll turn to God and you'll turn to the Holy Spirit in desperation and say, I can't do this. Now then, you take over. You do it. And suddenly the brakes will be taken off and away you'll go. Okay. So when you're pushing a car with a handbrake on, have you ever tried to do that? You take the handbrake off and away you go. And that's what the Christian life is like. Just remember that day when you put yourself into the hands of the Lord Jesus in order to be saved. Remember that? When you said to God, I can't save myself, I'm just a sinner, but I need to be forgiven, save me. And your life changed because he did it for you. And that's the same for the Christian. Every single morning and every single moment when a Christian says to the Holy Spirit, I cannot live this Christian life and I give up, but I'm putting myself in your hands and suddenly things are different. Suddenly the things are different. Suddenly the temptations aren't there. Not that all the temptations have gone altogether, but suddenly there's power in the Christian life. Suddenly, all of a sudden. Why? Is it because you've changed? No. It's because the Holy Spirit has come to accomplish in your life the things that he has come to do. So I'm hoping that this is a blessing to you. These are what you would call the alphabet, the ABC of the Christian life. It's the simplicity of what it means to be a believer.